Johann Galton's ancestors for several generations were all doctors and nurses. And when he was born on October 24, 1930, an uncle congratulated the family. Today, a new doctor is born. <laughs> in some way, Johann did become a doctor, but his patients are not individuals, rather whole societies with their pathologies. Uh, that uh, he is recognized around the world as the founder of the new academic field of peace studies. Um, he has written over 150 books on peace and related issues and over 1,500 articles. But he has not also, not only done theory, he has also practically applied what he has discovered and developed. Uh, he has mediated in over 100 international conflicts, uh, many of them successfully. And, uh, his books have been translated into 34 different languages. Uh, uh, Johann is someone who says what he believes. Uh, he does not try to guess what people like to hear and tell them something they like to hear. Through this, he has gotten access to presidents and prime ministers who are tired of always hearing people around them tell them what they think they would like to hear. They want to hear the truth as Johann sees it, even if they may not agree that they like to know about it. And uh, he has, uh, for this and many other reasons, uh, many enthusiastic uh, supporters and followers around the world. But he has also some uh, enemies who cannot take any criticism. But in fact, sometimes a critic may be your best friend. If you walk towards an abyss, who is your real friend? The one who says, go right ahead, you are on the right path. Or the one who says, stop, turn around, you are in danger. Obviously, it's clear to me who is a real friend. Uh, recently, uh, uh, because of some observations about the case of the Anders Breivik, who killed 77 Norwegians, uh, including almost Johann's granddaughter, who was on that island when the massacre took place. Uh, uh, he had testified, and uh, based on Breivik's writing, he has pointed out that he is firmly rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, for this, he has been labeled as anti-Semitic, which is, I think, totally, uh, uh, which is totally wrong. Uh, he is a friend of Israel. He wants the best for Israel, peace with its Arab neighbors. He has proposed a six-state solution, a Middle East community uh, modeled on the European community of 1958, which brought peace to Europe. Uh, if anyone likes to know more about this case, there will be a two-page information sheet available that you can pick up at the end. Now, uh, I'm uh, very, very grateful to Johan for speaking to us. He's uh, very busy and uh, travels constantly around the world, uh, giving workshops and lectures and mediating uh, conflicts. Thank you, Johan. Dieter is a very dear friend. And when I go wrong, Dieter whispers something in my ear. <laughs> now, uh, two issues were mentioned. It's the Brevi case in Norway, which fills many of us. And since I've been asked to testify in court, I am very busy preparing myself. Uh, there is also the case that has to do with the Brevi case and things quoted out of its context. I'm very open to you for questions about both of them, but first let me do the job, the lecture that is announced. And you can bring it in and try to make your questions sound relevant to the lecture. We live in a multipolar world 
and more particular, I would say, in a hexagon. And let me just draw for you the hexagon, hexagon, <coughs> what it looks like. You have the USA, and you have the European Union. You have an old, if you will, antagonist partner, or what you will call it, you have Russia. And the link between USA and the Soviet Union was a very antagonistic one. What it is today remains to be seen. And you have as a neighbor to Russia, you have giant China. As a neighbor to giant China, you have India. And between the European Union and India, you have OAC. You may read it in English as OIC. <laughs> The question is what you see. <laughs> the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Now if you look at these six, they differ very much in which extent they are coherent actors. The US, Russia, China, India are very clear actors on the international scene. The European Union is trying to become one with a common security and policy and foreign policy. And the OAC is quite loose. The OAC consists of 1,560 million Muslims. There are more Muslims in the world than Chinese. That's already something. It consists of 57 countries. <coughs> it is divided between the Arab part and the non-Arab part. And inside the Arab part, mainly inside the Arab part, but also into Iran, of course, between the Sunni and the Shia. There are other divisions, but you find divisions in all of them. <coughs> you find in China the division between the Han Chinese and the people that lord it over. The Tibetans, the Uyghurs, and the Inner Mongolians, three major examples. You find in Russia <coughs> 20 non-Russian nations, the most famous right now being Chechnya. You find in the United States a dominant nation that is often called the Wasps, <coughs> white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. But you also find in China five others. The first natives, the first Americans. You find the African Americans. You find the Inuits in Alaska. You find the Hawaiians. And you find the Hispanics, particularly in the part of the United States, that was stolen from Mexico in the world in 1846-48, in the southwest. And in Mexico lost 53% of its territory. And when the then President Polk said, we were challenged, there was an incident. There was a young congressman from Illinois who stood up in Congress in 1846 and said, President Polk, I don't believe you. Will you please take me to the place and show me exactly what happened? President Polk had no place to take him to because nothing had happened. The name of the young congressman was Abraham Lincoln. I just mentioned it. So having said that, I have said something about it. And my question today is the following. What is the guiding light emanating from this hexagon, from the six? You have two in the West, you have two in Asia, you have two in between. The hexagon looks like this. And I could now draw the 15 lines connecting, uh, complete it with the missing lines, 10 more lines, but it becomes so messy, so you just have to think of it. This is a major project that Samos is working on, the hexagon project. And you will see that something is missing. 
still to a large extent attached to the European Union, is the African Union, and still to some extent attached to the USA, is the Estados Unidos de America Latina y el Caribe, but then more correct it's also called CELAC, so Latin America. And there are some more parts of the world, but again my question is, the hexagon. And I now switch from the structure and from the actors to the messages. The developmental messages. And for that purpose, we can put these together in the West. And we have the Western liberal model, that was called the WN, W -Lib. And the Western liberal model tells you there are four things you should do. Number one is economic growth. <laughs> Number two is rule of law. Number three is the particular part of that called human rights. And number four is democracy. I believe in all of that. But I also believe in a couple of more things. This message is today waning in significance. It's being looked at around the world. And I would like to mention perhaps the four critiques that come out. Instead of economic growth, there's economic crisis. So the conclusion drawn is that there must be something wrong with the model. And that's something wrong, one can then define, and I'll come back to it. But I would like to mention two things immediately. One is increasing inequality. And there is a famous book now written by two medical people, epidemiologists, called The Spirit Level, which says that if you want a good society, the key is not economic growth, but growing equality. And what happens in the world, and in many countries, is growing inequality. In the United States, you have unfathomably rich people, and you have the same in China. But in the United States, the poor people sink further down. And in China, 400 million were lifted up from 1991 to 2004, according to the World Bank. It's a difference between those two. <coughs> Let us go to the next one on the line, and the next one is rule of law. The Western rule of law is focused on acts of commission and not on acts of omission. Most Westerners are not aware of it. You have to see it with the eyes and the ears of other civilizations. Somebody does a wrong thing against the commandments or against the law, or both. It's detected by the police, is arraigned into court, and there is a process which is very admirable in many regards. And if found guilty, he is sentenced, he found innocent, he walks out. What's wrong about that? Nothing. It's on the top of the iceberg. And that brings us back to economic growth. People are dying at the bottom. One is talking about the incredible number of close to 140,000, maybe more, per day are dying on starvation and of oh, preventable and curable diseases. But they don't have money. There's nothing they can do about it. Now, I call that structural violence. And direct violence is the killing. For direct violence, that's an act of commission. And you can be arraigned into court like Mr. Breivik is. 
which ask some questions about Norway. How could it happen in such a peaceful country? Well, I can tell you that's the wrong question. There are other aspects of Norway that can explain it, but we can come back to that later. But that was an act of commission. The structural violence can go on as long as nobody does anything about it. Like lifting the bottom 400 million up, for instance. Now, that's an act of omission. The people who engage in act of omission every day get off scot-free. And nobody is supposing that everybody who does, does nothing should be put into court. The point is that our law, our ethic, our morality is blind to it. Now, that's not the case in Islam. It's not the case in Buddhism. And you'll find Buddhism in Japanism and Chinaism. So if you look at it that way, it's a kind of minority position in the world. So, so much about the rule of law. There are many people in the world who say, if they can tolerate the horrors at the bottom of Western society, particularly the US right now, and what has happened in society if the West has dominated? There must be something wrong about their rule of law. Next one is human rights. They're beautiful, but they're incomplete. So I said rule of law is beautiful, but it's incomplete. What is missing are acts of omission. Human rights are beautiful. What is missing are collective human rights. An Asian committee on human rights has come up with three examples of collective human rights. It's not individual rights, it's the right of a collectivity to something. Collectivity number one, a village. And the village has a right to survive and not to be eaten up by an expanding city. When a city expands and eats up villages, we call it development. There are many people who don't see it that way. So the collective right of a village to live. The collective right of a traditional craft not to be eaten up by modernity. Like traditional fisheries as opposed to trawling. Blue water, deep ocean fishing, and so on. And the right of the extended family to be a juridical person. And the extended family is very important in East Asia. But Western juridical persons tend to individualize. If there is a company, the individual has the right to pull out his part of the capital and to dispose of it the way he wants. In other words, the collectivity cannot limit his monetary freedom. Well, many parts of the world don't see it that way. You can say the difference is between I culture and we culture. Come to democracy. One person, one vote. Beautiful. Problem is that that vote is individual. So it presupposes that you conceive of reality as consisting of individual units that make up their personal mind and then expresses that in an act of vote. <coughs> So there are many who would say that more important than that is dialogue. That you have inside a collectivity a dialogue, they know there is a problem, but to them consensus is important, not majority. So they would then accuse the West of arithmetic democracy. For drawing a line, and the line is drawn very neatly at 50%. And there is a kind of mathematical fascination with the digit 50. <coughs> kind of golden cut. So having said that, one should not be surprised if there is a longing and a yearning for other models to come up. And I then go first in this direction. <coughs> and I put down the Western Marxist. 
And then we're both going to say that there is more to it than the Soviet model, and there is more to the Western liberal than the US model. That the US is in crisis and probably will be hit by, by more. Uh, at least this, this year or next year, uh, we can come into that. It's not the end of the Western liberal model, nor is the end of the Soviet Union, the, the end of the Western Marxist. I just want to point out what it is. The Western Marxist model is based on basic needs. What's the basic needs model? Terribly important to Marx. And terribly important to all countries that had a so-called communist revolution. Mm -hmm. And the basic needs are often defined in terms of five. Water. Takes us make food <laughs> with clean water. Housing, clothing, health, education. So we tune in made this available at a low, sloppy level, but it was to a large extent available. It's not available in the US. Very many are deprived of it. And the statistics are still glaring that the life expectancy is lower and the infant mortality is higher in Washington DC than in Cuba. So in Cuba, these five are known as Los Cinco Bienes Fundamentales, the four basic goods. Now, where is freedom? Where is identity? Where is respect for the sacredness of life? Something is missing. So they then put on it, not the rule of law, but some kind of rule of history. That is written in the cards that after capitalism comes socialism and communism. And instead of uh, democracy comes the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, forget about those. And keep the basic needs. What Marx missed out on, and the Soviet Union missed out on totally, was the basic needs of nature. It's not there. No nature. So, what we are coming to now is the imperfection of all of them. And we go up, but maybe we should go across the board, and say that here we have the Islamic development model. So we have down here the Western liberal, the Western Marxist, and the Islamic. What's that? You see, let me first put it positive. And I am saying that each of them has a message, an important message. I'm also saying that each of them have important shortcomings. And you can already guess my conclusion. So why don't I give you the conclusion immediately? What's the answer? The best of all of the above. Pick the best from all of them. What's the best from Islam? Two points. Sharing. Excuse me. Togetherness and sharing. Togetherness and sharing. You now forget for a moment killing horrible crimes of honor, unquote. And you forget for a moment female circumcision. And of course anybody would say, any Muslim would say, not only you forget them, you should forget them because they're not Islam. <coughs> These are primitive tribal tradition of peoples who have converted to Islam, but it's not Islam. Let's leave that debate aside. And let us look at what does that mean, togetherness and sharing. 
Metaphorically, you can say, if you want to know what togetherness is, see how Muslims pray. On the knees, with the forehead to the floor, the carpet. Submission to God, to Allah. And so close together as you can be. So close that there's no way you could have men and women in the same prayer. So there's one room for the men, one room for the women. And the sisters are equally close. Now that closeness is a metaphorical, bodily metaphor, concrete articulation of the brotherhood, the we culture. You join us and you are one of us. And the sharing is the lifting of the bottom. Lifting up of the bottom. So let's go through the five pillars of Islam. The Shahada. I bear testimony to the fact that there is only one God. His name is Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. <coughs> so that is what they're saying. That's what they're sharing. Now, only one God. There is no God called the majority of the people. Only one God does not mean that you cannot be a polytheist. It means, literally speaking, that there is only Allah. That doesn't mean you cannot have democracy and parliament. You can have a parliament as long as it operates in the name of God. What is much can be said, let me just stop at that point. You take the second point, Salat, the common prayer, five times a day. That is togetherness. You take Zakat, the sharing with the people, with the poor. You take Ramadan, the fast. Let us say from six o'clock to six o'clock, make a time. It's to remind you what it is to have nothing to eat and nothing to drink. You may say they compensate in the evening. Yes, they do compensate in the evening. I wonder how many Western secularized Christians you could get to fast from 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening one month. Now, there is a formula I can share with you. You go to northern Norway, where it is known that we have midnight sun. But we have made, we have day darkness. So if it shall be from sunrise to sunset, there may be no sunrise and no sunset. So you don't have to fast. I can tell you the answer to that. Muslims in northern Norway go by Mecca time. So there's no way out. <laughs> you didn't know that because you were all thinking when you convert you'll go to northern Norway. So I'm just closing that option for you. <laughs> So having said that, all of this has its human side. You may believe more or less, you may be more or less perfect. The Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, puts the togetherness and the sharing in one act. They pay for those who cannot go to Mecca. You share it. I was once thrown off the plane in Pakistan because I was informed that the plane was for pilgrims. So off you go. And uh, I got some plane afterwards, but I was not the legitimate pilgrim, so that was quite clear. There's a message in this, and the message comes to the West. <coughs> Instead of togetherness, competitive individualism. <coughs> Instead of sharing, rising inequality. And there you had the vulnerability of Norway to Islam. It's not that Muslims or Arabs are invading Norway. They have something to offer, which secularized Christianity does not have. And you may be surprised to hear that Breivik, who almost killed my grandchild, knew this. And 
defining himself as a deep Christian, admonished Norwegian Christianity to become more spiritual and to offer something so that you wouldn't have conversion to Islam. That didn't happen. He is a violence extremist. He's not right wing or left wing. You have violence extremism to the left and to the right. It's not a monopoly of the left or right politically. How he became a violence extremist, I think the answer is through history. You know, his reading of history is a succession of battles between Islam and the West. And he can he jumps from one battle to the other. One battle was in 1099, and the Knights Templars conquered Jerusalem. <coughs> On which day? 22nd of July. The day that he chose for his atrocity. What makes a person be inspired by that much violence? I don't claim to know. But it's not a psychiatric case of individual craziness. In my view, he suffers from a collective psychosis brought about by the polarization between the West and Islam. And the psychosis is called Islamophobia. It's paranoid, and it is narcissistic. He's not the only one. It is shared by millions and millions and millions. It's shared by the Norwegian government killing Muslims in Afghanistan. So now you lift it out of the individualizing psychiatry to a more collectivist analysis. We leave that aside because Islam's force is a weak culture and the West's weakness is excessive eye culture. We are very proud of that eye culture. Individualism, <coughs> individual creativity, freedom of expression. But like everything human, it has its limitation and could turn into a caricature of itself. So much for the Islamic model, but let me add the economic aspect. In Islam, there is no ceiling, provided you have accumulated your riches in a way that is, from a Muslim point of view, permissible, legal, halal. But there is a floor, so you lift up the bottom. The idea that you should not sit down and eat before you're sure that in the 20 houses around you, they have enough to eat. So a kind of image of concentric circles around the person, lifting each other up, creates a different kind of social order. So we move on, and we have still three to go. We did not move into India. And we add to China an appendix called Japan. Why don't we add India? A caste system has no development model. It's a development model for the upper 20% of society. That's not development. There is no Hindu light, literally. But Hinduism had an offspring called Buddhism. And there is a Buddhist model of development. So what is it? You can say the Western model is the market model. There is no limit. There is no floor, no ceiling. <coughs> and the market is not about basic needs. The market is about maximizing net self-benefit. 
And you put into the market what you have and you get out if you're good at it, more than you put in. The Muslim model is, the Islamic model is, there is a floor but no ceiling. The Buddhist model is, there is a floor and there is a ceiling. It's called neither too little nor too much. You can say that the Buddhist thinking is neither too little, basic needs satisfied, nor too much. Why? Because real growth is spiritual. It's not material. <coughs> if you have too little, you will think of nothing else than where does my next meal come from? Like 16 million families in the US. If you have too much, you will think of nothing else than fire, robbery, thieves, taxation, and things of that kind. You have what is. In other words, too little and too much does not liberate you from spiritual growth, according to the Buddhist model. So where can the Buddhist model be best expressed? And they argue small communities. And the small communities is what Schumacher picked up in the slogan, Small is Beautiful. It's called the Sangha, with a temple for spirituality and a tank, meaning a well, for basic needs. Um, somebody might say it would be nice with some uh, vegetables <coughs> too because they are vegetarians, these people. Yes, some vegetables. Fresh air. And you have incredibly old people up in Buddhist monasteries high up in the Himalayas doing this. Very attractive and you can say it comes close to green philosophy in the West. So now we have the Buddhist model. What is the Chinese model and what's the Japanese model? Let's first say a word about Chinese civilization. It's an eclectic civilization. And I start with the Chinese because it's the oldest one. <coughs> and the point about it is combination of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. About this much can be said, but just like our Western civilization has a basis in Judaism, and then in the, in the West or in the Occident, to be more concrete, correct, we added Christianity and then Islam. So let us say that these two are the West, and if you add OAC, you can call it Occident, and this of course is the Orient, and Russia is somewhere in between. So if you look at it that way, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. A Chinese can put on his business card, I am a Taoist. Confucian and Buddhist. <coughs> and I am deeply interested in liberalism and Marxism. I think I am both. Try that in the West. I am a Jew, Christian and a Muslim, and a liberal and a Marxist. And you will be considered crazy. <laughs> And somebody will come in a white frock with a syringe to inject you and bring you to the place where you belong. Here you have, in one sentence, the strength of the Orient. The synergistic workings of three different things, you see. Now, what do the Chinese see as the goal of the whole thing? Not economic growth. The goal of the whole thing, in the Chinese point of view, is harmony. And harmony is called the mandate of the heaven. So I have been, since I'm often in China, I have asked, how do you know whether you have the mandate of the heaven or not? 
And uh, if you look at Chinese history, there is the idea of the bad emperor, good emperor, bad emperor, good emperor, two bad, and then three good, and so on. And the answer is, if there are people in the streets shouting at you, angry, demonstrating, throwing stones, and what is worse, you have lost the mandate of the heaven. So I then say, does that mean that the mandate of the heaven is the mandate of the people? <coughs> the mandate of the heaven expresses itself through the people. So if I then say, how about a popular vote? Having parties. And then they say, national multi-party national elections, to be sure you have the mandate of the people. And then they come up with a confusing answer. You have to balance this with the wisdom of the educated. So the leading part of the Communist Party has 70 million members, and today most of them, almost all, are university graduates. It's a paradise for university people. But old Confucianism had two more things. To be on top of the Confucian pyramid, you should be educated. You should be a man. And you should have white hair. Mm. What took care of that? What was the end to those two? The Cultural Revolution. I'm known in China as being one who tries to explain the Cultural Revolution. And I was told on Chinese television that I am known as one of China's five best friends. Not because we agree with all you say and you agree with all you say, so, but you try to understand us and we are not used to that. Okay, I see that as a compliment. And I try to understand China in Chinese terms. You see, this eclecticism of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism is for the people in the region, including my Japanese wife, so natural that you're not even conscious of it. And then you have a flying Norwegian, and this flying Norwegian says, that was your Confucian element, that was your Buddhist element, that, that is Taoism, and so on. I can only say, that you're very great. Because if you're totally used to it yourself, it might be useful to have somebody from the outset. <laughs> Confucianism tells you that China is at its best when the poverty is vested in old, well-educated males. The Cultural Revolution was the terrible disappointment with the Maoist Revolution. Because after the Maoist revolution, they found that the power was still in the hands of that group. And when I was visiting Professor first time in China, in uh, Chengdu, in the University of Sichuan, uh, there was this usual party reception, and you know who are you and my name is, and so on. And I was asking a somewhat elderly guy, and what is your field? He said, before the revolution, I was professor of Confucian studies. Now, after the revolution, I became professor of Marxist studies. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, this sounds like a smart guy. <laughs> Let us say flexible. <laughs> then I asked him, what are you doing now? <laughs> I'm professor of business administration. <laughs> And then I said, but have you ever administered any business? He said, I haven't, and that's why we need professors of business. <laughs> there you have China in a nutshell, you know. Often an anecdote is better than a long theory. Did he see any inconsistency? Not at all. He was answering to the challenge of the time. And I can tell you that he took his Confucianism and Marxism with him into the business administration. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting, and I could say a source of strength. 
What did I mean by word? Uh, well, let me say just one thing more about cultural revolution. I've been on Chinese television saying I know perfectly well that if I had been a Chinese professor at the time, I would have ended up on a cart with something he is saying, I'm a traitor to the people, spit at me. And I would not have enjoyed it very much. Not at all. But I understand their disappointment. That you have the same white-haired old males <coughs> with university degrees in power. What you see today in China is women all over the place and young people all over the place. All over the place. It's not the case before. And I have been in China over a sufficiently long span of time. And my wife and I, we are just flabbergasted. You see, one thing is the skyscrapers. That's a material thing. To see these young women all over the place in a self-assertive manner is fantastic. So these were the pioneers, the guards, the women guards coming. And what they did was, I don't think they killed many. But it was certainly verbally violent. And the older male professors who didn't already have white hair got it when they were handled by the Red Guards. So having said that, what do they mean by harmony? Well, they mean that people are content. How do they do that? They have a 2,500 years old pattern called petition democracy. And that means that outside each public building in China you can see a line of people, or people who have discussed some issue and other, and they come up with what they don't like, and there is a condition, you shall have a concrete proposal. And they're standing there, and inside the bureaucrats receiving those. And the guide who showed my wife and me that for the first time, he said, we call that idea democracy. You have arithmetic democracy. Right, true on it. I can tell you my answer. Would it be nice to have a little arithmetic check on the idea? Just a tiny little arithmetic check. Ahem, he said. <laughs> but you see, that would be eclectic, and eclecticism is their strength, and that is why they are now favoring voting. So they're now introducing local multi-party elections. And they're doing it to try to get control of corruption. What do the Japanese mean by harmony? Almost exactly the same thing, but they're a little bit behind. You see, Japan is Chinese thinking a couple of dynasties behind, because they haven't followed the recent trend. They haven't gotten the Marxist revolution, and they haven't gotten the cultural revolution. So the Chinese are still living in the Min dynasty, or if you are generous, in the Qing dynasty, in some cases the Tang dynasty, the Japanese. And to them it's very Confucian. Very Confucian, and with Confucius there was the idea Harmony in the family, harmony in the village, harmony in the province, harmony in the nation, harmony in the world. And there is a tendency to start with harmony in the family. It's not a bad place to start, but you shouldn't stop at that place. I think the Japanese are a little bit bewildered. <coughs> but they did something terribly important. And I will just give a glimpse into how Japanese and Chinese think economically different from us. And I think what many people are not aware of is that Chinese economic thinking comes from Japan, comes from the Japanese Empire. <coughs> and the Japanese Empire produced, among other things, an econ economist, a genius, and he's so good that he's not known in the West, because he's totally, absolutely not Western. Kanana Akamatsu. You know the Ricardian theory of comparative advantages. 
which has been a disaster. You have much resources and not much technology. We have much technology and very little resources. You send the resources to us. And we send you back ready-made goods. It freezes the situation. <coughs> so Kanva Kamatsu say, we develop our resources. And in Japan, we have no mineral resources, nothing of that. We have human resources. The first thing we do is health and education. That means socio-economic human rights first, civil, political later. If you can do everything at the same time, fine. But the East Asian message is socio-economic first, civil, political later. As you do that, you make ever more sophisticated products. You may have to import some resources, but you imprint them with maximum sophistication. You don't make locomotive engines, you make integrated circuits. So a maximum of culture imprinted <coughs> on a minimum of nature. When you have little nature, you put maximum culture. And by doing that, they outcompeted the West in a certain period, that was say the 60s, 70s, 80s. In the 80s, they were overtaken by the countries where they had preached this. Mm -hmm. Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea. They were called dragons, which is not a very interesting word. It doesn't reveal deep understanding. If you have called them four mini Akamatsus, it would have been better. They were not that small, and Japan was absolutely shocked how quickly they were all competed. Then came China. Then came China and did exactly the same. Health and education first, during Maoism. Then came Deng Xiaoping and said, now we start economic growth. And after that, we start, quote, opening up. And that means civil political rights with the Chinese character. Now, what I do then is detailed and complicated, but um, better know it than just critique it. Harmony means negatively absence of revolt. And the Chinese leadership is now desperate because there are more revolts than ever. How do they handle it? By the bureaucrats coming out of the buildings and sitting down together with the revolters, discussing with them, would this help, would this help, would this help? The revolt then moves on to the next place, and the bureaucrats move on to the next place. I have not seen one single leading U.S. politician sitting down with the Occupy movement, trying to understand them. They are operating with the New York Police Department and the Los Angeles Police Department, trying to apply the Patriot Act and things of that kind. It's not the approach. Harmony, the mandate of the heaven. In China, a, let us say it, reformed Confucianism. Very reformed, open to women and to the young. China is still led to a large extent at the top by males. Many of them white-haired, educated. So where do the rest go? They go to the local community. I think I have never seen a country in such a spiritual decline as Japan, losing faith in itself, being overtaken by its own offspring, being emotionally very tight to the United States, very tight to it, because they were beaten by the US. And this told them that our sun goddess 
is nothing relative to God, and God lives in Washington. Mm -hmm. So give us today our daily answer, our daily portion of Americanism. A friend of mine has said that Japan has become a monotheistic country, and God lives in Washington. Now, another friend of mine, Indian, has said that Indian Hinduism has changed. Nirvana is in the USA. That's where you can find it. Both of them then have the problem that Nirvana is sinking <laughs> and how to handle that spiritually. Then comes Fukushima on top of that, interpreted by many Japanese as the punishment for us having betrayed ourselves. I now come towards the conclusion. Here you have six models. The Japanese were masters of overcoming the Western contradiction between state and capital by having them working hand in hand. And the Western contradiction between capital and labor by having them working hand in hand. And the Chinese have copied much of that. But if you now are, to say, in an African country or any country in the world, where do we go now? And I would say all of the above. So, since I am sometimes asked that question, and I'm sitting now in a fictitious country and I've been asked that question, Pick from the West, all of it in a modified form. Economic growth, but with enormous attention to distribution. It's perfectly okay for an economist to give it a percentage of economic growth, if at the same time he gives it a percentage of equality growth. And if that percentage is negative because there's inequality growth, then you know something. If he doesn't give you that, dismiss him, send him back to school for re-education. <laughs> tell him bluntly that you're like a professor in geography who tells me the longitude but not the latitude. I would like to have both. When it comes to rule of law, be sensitive to acts of omission. When it comes to human rights, bring in some collective human rights comes to democracy, bring in transparency and dialogue. Marxism. Wonderful. Bring in all the Western liberal things on top of that. Now, the welfare state is an effort to bring in basic needs, to modify the Western liberal model to the Western social democratic model, which some Americans call communism. Uh, which is it not quite. Now, if you look at that, there are ample possibilities of combining. So we make the jump across the board to Islam. Bring in the idea of a more spiritual, secular Christian West. Not ritualistic Christianity with 52 sermons and the priest turning the bunch of sermons when he has passed the new year. And in the Spanish the Catholic countries in Spain, he has passed Los Reyes, and he starts again the same way. Could be that he invites for discussion. After Muslim prayer, they meet for discussion. Not necessarily in the same room, and it varies from place to place. Now you can say that it's church coffee. <coughs> it's not quite the same. People are yearning and burning to discuss spiritual problems. And the West has given them a very meager menu. Sharing with the poor. Lifting the bottom up. US, please turn it up. This is not the road to go. And at this point, I open a little footnote. 
you may not know what was at the root of the economic crisis, there are many things, but one way of describing it, what was at the root of it, were three American com economists, Black, Scholz, and Merton. Black was Chinese, he died, Scholz and Merton got the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics for an equation. And the equation was giving you the price of a derivative. And the derivative is the betting of a betting on the betting on the betting. It's some kind of horse race writ large. So we have a bet on horses and a horse race, and you sell the bet in the middle of the race. And then you sell the bet in the middle of the race. What's the price of the bet? The Black Scholes equation was an equation to say that. They only forgot one thing. They forgot the thing that Dieter Fischer mentioned. If you're driving in a car towards the abyss and you're accelerating, it's very easy to calculate your speed. But it might be a good idea to point out, look, I am not so, I can calculate the speed for you, but uh, will you please turn around? In the Black-Scholes equation, there was no limit. There was a stability around and there was no tipping point where the equation was no longer valid. So they founded a company called Long-Term Capital Management. After two years, it was a catastrophe. 3.5 billion in debt and they were bailed out by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is neither federal nor reserve. That's why it's called the Federal Reserve. <laughs> it's a club of banks, and they were terribly impressed by that equation that had earned many, many people a good money. But the limitations were not stated. So why this long footnote? Well, it is, of course, Know your limitations. Know the range of validity of what you have. And each of the formulas here have a certain validity. The Buddhist formula. I love it with my heart. But my mind tells me that I would be bored after half a year. Now, maybe I had to work on myself. And that after half a year of carrot juice on top of a beautiful mountain with whipped air to supplement the carrot juice, I would be longing for a two-star Michelin restaurant. <laughs> in other words, the sinner would come up in me. So maybe I would like to live in a society where there are all those things together, in a sense. So maybe a pluralistic, eclectic society would be more interesting. And that to me is the sense of globalization. Globalization is to take the best from all of them. And at that point I stop. Thank you. Thank you.